As a hacktivist educator, I teach hacktivism. At the root of hacktivism is subversion. I teach subversion. Now, when I tell people this, they usually think that I teach inner city youth how to hack into the Pentagon <laughs> and disarm our nuclear weapons. Now, that does sound cool. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Or that I teach kids how to code so that they can fill STEM jobs in Silicon Valley and make the tech industry more profitable, diverse, and inclusive. That's also important and is the work of many of my colleagues, but it's not what I do. I raise hackers to become hacktivists, and I learned from the best. At 14 years old, I first met Dr. Monroe after I was expelled from her school, <laughs> the Frederick Douglass Academy in Harlem. I, well, she learned that I hacked into her school, which was a much better school. She invited me into her office and wanted to speak face to face. And of course, when I walked in and I saw her face, it just froze me in place. Because she's an educator, teacher, and you all know somebody, a teacher, who could just freeze you when they see you. <laughs> and I may have adapted that into my career. But Dr. Monroe wanted to know why, because she wanted to find out why is it that I hacked my behavior records and not my academic records. <laughs> so uh, she pulled me, had a conversation with me, and, uh, and, she, and she said, how? Like, how did you do it? She says, because according to your academic records, you're one of the brightest kids in the country. And so I leaned into Dr. Monroe, And I said, well, middle school records are really easy to hack into. No one looks at middle school. I mean, is it my fault? <laughs> she wasn't having that. <laughs> And so she asked why I did it. And because she cared to know, I decided to tell her what I'm sharing with you that at eight years old, I read every book in my group home library. These were the books that were donated to us foster kids with no families, no home. Read every book, every year. Pippi Longstocking and Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and Peter Pan. And so I asked for more books. And they said no. But Something happens when you read Huckleberry Finn and Pippi Longstocking. I decided I'm going to take a page out of Oliver Twist, and I'm going to ask for more in front of everyone. Because I knew that they were going to ask for, they were going to say that there was no money, that there were no money for, for the books. But as an eight-year-old vegetarian, I calculated that they had to be saving money for every meatloaf they weren't feeding me. <laughs> But time and again, every time I asked, they said no, they said no in front of everyone, and it kept going back to, as a kid, there's nothing you can do. But I noticed something, a pattern, that they didn't care if we cried ourselves to sleep. They didn't care if we did our homework. What they did care was that we had three meals a day, on time, every day. And so at eight years old, for three to four days, I held a hunger strike. <laughs> And I won. <laughs> Now, I told Dr. Monroe this story And she knew that I had gotten this far on my own, but I needed her help 
to go much further. But the foster care system strikes back because they wanted to be transferred from her school. And Dr. Monroe was not having it. They would come up to her and ask her for my address. And she would give them my location. And by the time they got there, she moved me somewhere else. <laughs> they would come back to her, asked for my address. And then Dr. Monroe said, why are you bothering me? I'm a principal of hundreds of kids. How am I going to pay attention to just one kid? Okay, well, here you go. Here's his location. And by the time they got there, she moved me somewhere else. In 1994, Dr. Monroe created an underground railroad for my future. <laughs> she passed away earlier this year, leaving behind a legacy of transforming the lives of kids just like me, similar situations. Yeah. Dr. Monroe, I love you and thank you for believing in me. But why? Why would she jeopardize her career? Why would she break the law? Dr. Monroe believes, as most educators, good educators believe, that schools in America are not created equal. That we set up kids, especially low opportunity youth, to be sets of skills and schools to be skills factories. When the purpose of education is to institute innovation, and the purpose of innovation should be to eliminate poverty. Therefore, the purpose of school is to erase poverty. And so Dr. Monroe knew that, and she knew something that, Dr. Monroe, uh, that, that Malcolm Gladwell also knew, that Poverty is not desperation or deprivation. That poverty is isolation. So when she heard the story of me being this hacker, she transformed that hacker into a hacktivist because she knew that the first thing I was hacking was my isolation. The story of the Underground Railroad is a story of subversion. That Dr. Monroe transformed me to a hacktivist and modeled for me what it is to subvert a system that doesn't work for us and how to create a new one. But the relationship between activists and hacktivists is interesting during the times of the fugitive slave laws. The abolitionist, the activist, was fighting for millions of rights, the rights of millions of people on the front end while hacktivists, like the conductors of the Underground Railroad, were using document forging, masonry, they even co coded program codes into quilts just to subvert a system that saved the lives of hundreds of thousands. Now, the relationship between hacker and hacktivist, that gets even more interesting. Because we exist in these, uh, these giant networks, and they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. These giant networks that Me Metcalfe's law breaks down that they increase in value the more people participate. Values create participation. Participation creates value. The problem is, is that as these networks keep getting bigger and they drive our economy and our democracy, there are vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities are loopholes and exploits. Now, loopholes are static and legal. They they're taken advantage of by the elite, by those who have the knowledge of those loopholes. They're not important right now. I want to talk about exploits. Because although loopholes are creating an imbalance in our systems, exploits are interesting because they, there aren't any laws for exploits or they uh, eventually become illegal. Hackers and hacktivists use exploits. We use them differently. 
But the question is, why do these vulnerabilities exist? And that's because we don't update. We don't update when we want to. We, we, we don't update when we have to. We update only when we are forced to. I mean, think about your phones, your computers. Think about your wardrobes. <laughs> that we think that what worked before is always going to work again, even if for 20 to 100 years, it hasn't worked. The problem is, is that some of these hackers have escalated their behavior. Imagine those who were shouting, they would not replace us in Charlottesville, all learn to code. And they are. Because hackers, typical hackers, we learn how to use exploits to take, to tamper, and to troll. But now it's escalating to terrorize. Have you noticed the number of conspiracy videos that are popping up on YouTube? And that's because they are grooming the next generation of alt-right hackers as young as 11 years old. Now, hacktivists are different. Hacktivists, we use technology to heal the world. And you're a hacktivist. Every time you throw up a cell phone to record discrimination, to capture something that's not right, you are doing more than sometimes the system does for us. And I have a message. I have a message for the alt-right hackers, because as a black man talking about hacking, as soon as this video comes up, they will definitely try to hack me. <laughs> but this message comes from Dr. Monroe. And it's not just to the alt-right hackers, it's also to all the grassroots entrepreneurs out there who are fighting the good fight of teaching kids to code. And that message is, you have gotten this far on your own but you can do better, you can do more. I invite you to become a hacktivist like George H. Hofstetter. So George Hofstetter, he is one of the kids who I've come across 13, 14 years old when I met him, who was inspired by a hackathon that I threw in the name of Trayvon Martin. I asked all the developers if there's an app that can save Trayvon Martin. But George, couldn't be here uh, because there's a rule in TEDx where only one person can be on stage. Uh, but I decided to hack that rule. <laughs> and so George fought work, a cold, and everything else in order to record this video for you. Hey, Sonoma. My name is George Hofstetter. I'm 18 years old, and I'm from Oakland, California. Before I saw Black Panther's Wakanda, I experienced Wakanda when I participated in my first Kino hackathon. Like Dr. Monroe did with him, Kalima took my tinkering with an iPhone and inspired me to create my own tech company and develop an app that could have saved Trayvon Martin's life. Everyone's looking for the next Black or Brown, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, or Bill Gates. We're right in front of you but we don't want to build the same things they did and not all of us want to work for them. As hacktivists, when we see what doesn't work in our society, we build new tools for a better democracy. No more Trayvon Martins, no more wars, digital divides, or poverty when it's our future to update. Join me in that future. Dr. Monroe updated me, I've updated George. Let's all update each other. And I share this message on behalf of the hacktivist community. To get things done, the hacktivist rides on the shoulder of giants that came before them, connecting with the past and propelling us all into the future. They are often in the emotional heat of the present and must consider the ethics of each situation 
and proceed for the greater good. Thank you and hack on. <laughs>